Hey everyone, welcome back to the final best of for the month of November 2022 for the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Now, why I say it's the final uh, monthly one, uh, as we go through the month, we're going to actually have a look back throughout the entire year. I like to um, highlight some of the really great stories, conversations I had with people and just kind of remind people. I know people are super busy with, you know, the holidays coming up, taking a break. And so I just wanted to kind of compile some of that, you know, some of those great stories to put in one space. But um, as a little introduction before we get into um, this month's uh, look back and, and best of month, uh, I, I really have been thinking a lot about how I consume and create information, how important that is to me. And this year, I've kind of backed off a little bit. Like, I'll take time. I have really great conversations, but I, I don't spend as much time on social media. I don't spend as much time on Twitter, Instagram, those things. I kind of just post and take off. And the reason I'm doing that is I'm really trying to, I don't know, it sounds weird, stay off my devices, stay off my phone, and really kind of be thoughtful of, like, what am I doing when I am actually creating that time? So, like, even just this introduction, I'm really trying to reflect and share and hopefully impart some ideas and thoughts for you and and you do with it as you as you will, because I really try to focus on it. You know, a lot of people do those like, what's my word for the year? And I think a lot of times we, you know, people create that and they don't stick with it. And so I like to kind of figure out like what what I'm focusing on through the year, throughout the year, like what what is needed at that time and really kind of revisit it. And I think for me, a word that's coming up over and over again is the ability to be present and I think that having access to all this information is wonderful, but I think sometimes we get lost in the avatars that we don't realize that, you know, the person talking to you right now is a human being, right? Is a real person. The, the person you are interacting with on Instagram, whether they have a 10 million followers or one, they are people. And we lose sight of that because we don't actually have that human connection. And I, I read this uh, book and I, I linked it in the below. And it's just something I want you to think about before you kind of listen to this. Um, it, it, it's a book from uh, Eric Barker, who I actually had on the podcast, which is one of the reasons I love doing the podcast is sitting down and having conversations with sometimes people I never thought I would have a conversation with. And in his book, Plays Well with Others, he shares, um, there's this one snippet I want to share with you. And he says, Conrad Zeus, who is considered the father of the modern computer, said, the danger that computers will become like humans is not as great as the danger that humans will become like computers. And wow, did that hit me. Uh, Barker goes on, we end up in a place where we have neither community nor solitude, always connected but never fulfilled. Technology and social media aren't evil, but when they replace real community, we have a problem because we don't get the meaningful bonds we need. We don't truly feel in it together or a part of something. We have too much control and autonomy to have any kind of collective identity. And so that hit me. That really kind of struck to me when I was reading that, um, again, from Barker's book, Plays Well with, Plays well with Others. So here's just a, something to think about. If you listen to this podcast and you listen to or you consume a piece of information, Share it with a friend. Do that. Share it with a friend. But don't just share it with a friend and then have the conversation behind the screen. Go have a conversation with that person. You know, and sometimes we don't have access uh, to that face-to-face -face time, but Zoom with them. Uh, call them and talk about it and dig into it. And, you know, a lot of times people will post things um, to, you know, share their thoughts. But then if you try to have a conversation with them, they don't want to necessarily get into it. And it's funny because I sometimes think about that. Are they sharing it because they want to have a conversation or they want the points, right? And just kind of thinking about that, take some time. Like we need to like consume less and talk more. And I'm not saying don't consume. I'm saying kind of the opposite, but like let's dig into this stuff and let's dig into it with people. So take some, one of the conversations that you connect with, you know, and there's just a little snippet timestamp it, find that video, share it with somebody and then say like, Hey, I would love to follow up and talk more about this and have more of a conversation. And I think that that notion that humans will become like computers is terrifying, but we always have the opportunity. I am, I'm, 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 I'm with the idea that with Barker's, you know, I don't believe social media is bad, but I think it can, um, 
push us into a direction where we we look for an easy way out. We don't look for meaningful connection. And this is something I've really tried to focus on this year and I feel honestly better because of it. And so I hope that in this time where we can build this community, I don't want to be the person, the only person that you connect with in this video. I want to be the starting point and then you actually hopefully connecting with other people that you, you hear from. But take those times to connect with the people in your own communities. It is an amazing time we live in that we can connect with people all over the world. doesn't mean much if we can't connect with people closest to us. So just some thoughts. I hope you enjoy this month's um, edition of the Best of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I'm like of the belief, if you're unhappy in your job, then go. Just go. Like, I think that's part of it too, is that don't spend your whole life doing something that makes you miserable. And I probably have said this a million times that some of the best decisions I've ever made in my life were not accepting a ju new job. It was actually leaving one. It was actually saying like, Hey, this is, this is something that's better for me to kind of go through this process. So I think a lot of times, uh, you know, kind of the idea of like failure before success that we feel like, oh, we like let down people, like we let down kids. But if you're in a space where you're not happy, that's going to translate to your students. That's going to translate to the people around you. And it, that's that's where a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the issues come from. So that's why I was like really interested in kind of, you know, digging more into what you're doing, because I think there, I think there is, um, like even when we were, I don't know, this has been something to share that like um, this generation, and I don't know, I don't know if I'm Gen Z or millennial or I don't even know what I am. I'm like kind of wherever, like they're going to have way more careers than the, you know, the generation previously. So I don't, I don't see it as a, a negative. I, I see it as, you know, I think it's actually, it's a good thing that we have. And you have a lot of educators who have amazing skills that translate outside of education as well. So like, how, how are you like, is that something you're seeing too? Is that some of the things that they've, done really well in education have actually led to some of these new opportunities. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. And you know, I agree, with, I agree with what you're saying. You know how it is if you've been on a PLC and you've got somebody that's not enjoying the work anymore, is burned out or whatever the case may be, it can soil and solely the experience of, of all the other teachers and your attitude and your morale. So I do agree with you that it's best to try something different, whether it's for a while or, you know, education will probably be there to welcome you back later. And, and that's been a huge issue for me as someone that does coach teachers that are transitioning is that they do need to understand that they are very marketable. Mm -hmm. We think because this is the way we do things in the education space that you need to have a degree that is suited to the role. And then someone's going to look at your resume and say, oh, they're checking all of the boxes mm -hmm. and they've got the skills clearly because they've done this before and they've got this degree and I want to hire them. And that's not the case. What you want to do is figure out what the employer's problem is and then demonstrate almost as a sales endeavor that you mm -hmm. are the solution to their problems. And let me tell you, employers need people with communication skills. That's number one. And I hear this over and over because I, I talk to recruiters and I talk to hiring managers and they need people that can present and they need people that can lead meetings and they need people that know how to create written communication for a variety of audiences. These are the things that we're doing without even realizing it in as educators. But I think there are other soft skills too that we don't recognize always. And one of those that's really key is empathy. And teachers have this in, you know, multitudes. That's that ability to understand where people are and meet them where they are and to have people feel felt so that they're more apt to respond to you. And that is that is invaluable in the workplace, but especially as we're talking about these 21st century careers and we're in the tech space increasingly, you know, when we thought, you know, as educators, we never thought that we were, you know, in the tech space, but increasingly, it's it's really saturated with tech, right? And needs people that are proficient in tech, 
wasn't that way when I was teaching, you know, even 12, 15 years ago. Yes. And so if you can demonstrate that you've got that ability to, to listen, you know, with empathy and to understand someone else, that's something that tech product designers need. They want to understand, you know, how someone's going to use a product or use a piece of software. And that's something that we're really great at. My focus is on really how do we focus on deep learning and technology can, you know, enhance that in many ways, or and sometimes it doesn't. It just kind of matters on the situation. So when you were actually thinking about when you brought me in, like what was some of the thinking behind that to like why like why at the time in Clover, we were talking about this, a lot of people I talk a lot about change. A lot of your staff actually um, grew up there, went away for a couple of years and taught there. So, you know, maybe change is not their thing in some ways. So what was some of the thinking behind bringing me in to, to talk to your staff? In the to, first place? Today. So our thinking for bringing you in to, and just to give it a little bit of context uh, before the pandemic hit, our district, we were trying to dip our toes into personalized learning. And so we had a, a mini conference. Uh, it wasn't anything quite like the scale of what we did this summer. Right. Uh, but we had one because we were trying to dip our toes into it. And I will say, if I think back to those times before the that, we were really thinking about the what of personalized learning, like the flexible seating and that sort of thing rather than the who of personalized learning. And so the who of personalized learning is, is the kids and then of course their teachers. And so um, one of the things I think George that resonates in all your books is, is that that whole heart piece and the building, the connections is what resonates there. And so we, we wanted to give teachers the permission to understand Yes, we're we're focused on academics and we're focused on high standards and, and we're not ever saying that we're not. But before you can get to those pieces, you really have to connect with the kids and get at their heart. And so one of the things that I think everyone sees coming out of the pandemic is um, it, you've really got to work a little bit harder in building those relationships with students and making that connection with them. And so we felt like we needed to give our teachers some permissions to think about building connection and make building heart um, with your students and, and just and loving loving your students. And that's why we really thought about that. So today, this summer, the thought was focus on the kids and and the whole ownership and agency with the around the kids. And that was the thinking for this summer. Now, we're going to move on and, and we're going to do uh, some more connections because we already have a, a date on the calendar for uh, the 2023 mini conference. Mm -hmm. But in bringing you in, we were really trying to connect with our teachers' hearts to mm -hmm. show them we appreciate you. We love you. We thank you for what you're doing to support children. And we're going to work on how do we build those connections with kids. And, and what I, like what I love about that is the idea is it, it's not stops at relationships because I think a lot of people get kind of, you know, when we talk about that. It kind of starts with that. Some people get a kind of like a fluffy feeling, right? Like it's just yes. like, oh, we love the kids. And I'm, yeah, of course we love the kids, right? right. But it's actually it is actually to build that relationship. It is way easier to challenge kids, to push them, to get them to right. live right when when they yes. when when you're pushing them and you know they they they're not as nervous to fall because they know someone has their back back and that's, that's part exactly of it too. Right. like i'm actually i think years ago i wrote a blog post like saying like relationships are important but they're also not enough right it's it's exactly. the beginning of that um and then kind of moving forward so let's say i i read this book and i embrace all the things that you're talking about <laughs> what will the end result of that look like so that's a tough question, right? Yeah, I, it I, I is. All this in about education is that, yeah. like, hey, if we do all the things that you say, what will that actually look like, right? Like, hey, this is the yeah. mission, this is the mission. What will this look like if, if we do all these things to say? What, what does that look like in our classroom, right? Like, uh, we like I was actually just writing about this before um, I got on this podcast with you. It was like, hey, we want to be all our kids to be career and college ready, but then actually people don't follow kids when they leave school to see if they achieve those things. <laughs> right. So it's like, well, how do you know that you actually achieve those things? Are you just saying that for public consumption or, you know, like how, how do I know that? Like, what, right. what does that, what does that look like? You know, the end result. 
Yeah. I mean, from, from my perspective, it's going to be healthier relationships throughout your life. Mm -hmm. Um, because you know, who you are at school should be the same person you are in the grocery store and the same person you are at home, Mm -hmm. you know, and too often educators put all of their patience and energy and focus into their students and don't have enough when they go home. And that's when, you know, some habits and choices, you know, don't align with the the values and the principles that they say they espouse at school. Um, And so I think as you go through and you realize that, you know, how you ask a question, you know, whether you're talking to your first grader uh, in your classroom or your ninth grader in your English classroom or your spouse or your own child at home, you know, how you do that is a habit and a choice. And so for me, somebody who reads this book and says, you know what, I'm going to think about how I engage in each conversation. And, And one of the things I say in that book is that after every interaction, you either built up capital and strengthen the relationship with the person or you broke it down. You don't really maintain it. Right. And so what are you doing to build up those relationships? How are you positively engaging in those? And, you know, where are you at the end of the day? I mean, in terms of, you know, do you still have energy? You know, how much are you, right. how much are you putting in your own tank? I think it's a really, I think it's a fine line. I think it's something people are talking more and more about coming out of the pandemic is looking for that, um, I refer to it in the book as a work-life uh, harmony, not a balance, because I don't know that it should right. be a perfect 50-50. Um, and there are times where, like, if you're on some, if you're at the beach for a week for vacation in the summer and you're a 12-month administrator, you shouldn't be thinking about work. You should be right. all in on your family time. Yeah. Uh, and there's other times where you have to say to your spouse, I'm not going to be home tonight. I have a board meeting coming up. I have to meet with the superintendent, whatever it is. You know, you're going to be leaning a little heavier towards work, but at the end of the week, end of the month, end of the year, how was your rhythm? You know, were you able to, to seamlessly go back and forth? I, I needed to change my focus. And so probably after my first year as being an administrator, like I was like, my dream job would be to run this district. And what Mm. I mean by run is lead it. And I, I, this, this has been my, that's been my goal since 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 that that moment and you know it was interesting that you said that was your dream job and you had the taps on the shoulder um i haven't necessarily had the taps all the time because our current superintendent has done an unbelievable job dr maris done an unbelievable job since 2011 and um i don't know he uh he's uh he's retiring and taking a job with um uh like a computer educational computer consulting firm that is very close to us, but um, it's going to be a really a change in his life, obviously, um, because he really has been doing this since 2011. So he doesn't, doesn't know any different. um, And he has been the man. And so um, there really hasn't been a a passing of the baton per se, but also I looked at it this way. Like I could have been like, man, I thought he, he was going to be this unbelievable mentor and everything he's done from a visible standpoint, like I've seen, and I've been like, that's impressive. But I also, I, I, I can't expect that of somebody. His, his job is to be the superintendent of Ashland city schools. That's mm-hmm. his job. His job is not to be Steve Paramore's mentor. But when I am a leader by nature, like that, that's my nature is like, how do I make, how do I add value to that person? How do I make that person better what can i do to serve you to get you to reach your goals and so that is kind of like okay i've got to move into this is my opportunity these seven months i have to prove to the community i have to prove to the students i have to prove to the staff that i'm worth following i'm Mm -hmm. i'm that leader that's worth following and i'm I mean, we all talk about servant leadership. That's that's easy to talk about. If I'm if I'm going to talk the talk, I got to live it. And I, I feel like that when I set my feet on the ground in the morning, I feel like I got to make this the best day possible for not only Steve Paramore, but but everybody that I come in contact with. Like you said, I I made time for it as a leader because I you know, like, Hey, we need to reflect, but we're going to bombard you with information and then you do it on your own time. So like as, as a, a principal, current principal, what are, are there some ways that you 
kind of build in time for people to reflect, um, you know, in yours on your staff, like where they can actually like have that time for like reflection, because I, I feel we're just so into collaboration that it's like, I just, can you just give me some time to process things? Like, can I just think for a second, right? Before you ask me to contribute, right? So like, how, how do you look at kind of building that in with your staff? Uh, on uh, Sundays, um, I actually send, um, I write my memo mm -hmm. and then I turn it into a video. Um, within it, I actually ask my staff to reflect. We reflect on one data point, uh, and then we reflect on um, four instructional uh, practices that we were trying to perfect. So I tell them we never we're shooting for perfection, but we're not there yet. Right. And so um, I try to get them to think about this is what I saw, and I use real pictures of people in the building who are doing it right. Right. And so I embed um, a picture if I see a teacher. It could have been just something simple. It could have been us embedding um, some instructional, um, whatever we were teaching the instruction into like our morning message for children. Yeah. Some teachers will put some errors in there and if they were teaching uh, punctuation, commas, whatever it was, they'll, they'll infuse that into their message. Mm -hmm. And so the children are looking for those errors. It right. could have been um, you, um, the teacher that was doing that that math practice where um, all of the children were, are struggling with math across the country. And so she was just using addition so that her children wouldn't feel intimidated when she told them we would divide mm -hmm. uh, because they could, they could add something right. really simple, really, really simple. It could have been a picture mm -hmm. of children working together um, and say, are you giving children enough time to process the information that you're teaching? Are you just continuously going through your lesson thinking, oh, I got to get this done. I got to finish this lesson today. But children needed more time to work together to figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, and so I infused that time. Um, I also moved our collaborative planning to the afternoons mm -hmm. um, because when you have it during the daytime, um, there's a time constraint. And so we started at 3.30. Um, and they know that, you know, we're stopping at 430, but I found that uh, most weeks they go until five. Sometimes right. they walk out the room and they still down the hall talking to each other because they're still reflecting right. on the conversations that they were having. Um, I always start with reflection questions throughout. So mm -hmm. it makes you think. Um, and they the teachers, I thought they would hate it. I was like, oh, so. So that means we're going to meet every Wednesday after school and they love it because they get to actually see each other and see what's uh, hear what's going on across the grade levels every week. And they absolutely love sharing the strategies. Every other week, we just throw out strategies that we're using to help or I'll ask the teacher, do you have a, um, is there a problem of practice we need to talk about basically? So what are you teaching and uh, do you need some tips? on how to uh, get children to understand it. And mm -hmm. um, like my newest teachers, it could be the old teachers, like we're working on on this and my children are not quite getting it. And then the teachers in the other grade levels will say, well, have you tried this right here or that? And it's one of the most powerful mm -hmm. uh, reflective sessions I've ever seen. And it was just, it was just accidental because there just wasn't enough time to get it done during the day. Mm -hmm. But my teachers like really uh, love it. They started without me. If I'm still out there with children at this so I walked in. It's like we already started. Mm -hmm. um, and so like like they're doing it on their own now. 